Hey all, thanks for listening to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, Eric Christensen, pharmacist. Uh, today I'm going to cover nitrofurantoin, which is a drug that is most commonly used uh, as an antibiotic to treat urinary tract infections. Now its brand names that it goes by is Macrobid or Macrodantin. And a lot of times people get these uh, brand names mixed up. Uh, really, the, the primary difference is in dosing. And if you remember Macrobid, that is a twice-a-day drug. So remember BID at the end, and uh, that'll help you remember that that is uh, twice a day versus Macrodantin, which is generally dosed uh, four times a day. Macrobid is that combination of uh, basically the, the form of the drug, monohydrate, uh, plus macrocrystals, and macrodantin is uh, macrocrystals only. But a uh, big dif- difference from a you know patient clinical perspective is uh, macrobid is uh, dosed twice a day, and that is generally the one that we use uh, most often there. Now, how this drug works, how this drug uh, helps us, you know, basically kill off bacteria, get rid of that infection, is this drug is actually altered by bacteria flavo proteins. And this forms these reactive metabolites, which can ultimately, uh, you know, block processes, interfere with processes surrounding uh, bacterial protein synthesis. So kind of a little bit of a unique uh, mechanism of action in that respect. Now, I mentioned that this drug is certainly used for UTIs, and and that's really its primary and only um, major use. Now, one really, really important thing is nitrofrantoin is not that active against infections that may have systemic involvement. So if you get a situation where you've got, you know, maybe more of an upper UTI uh, syndrome or an infection where maybe the kidney is involved and you're at risk of systemic infection, this drug may not cover that infection as well. So generally, nitrofurantoin is going to be reserved for uh, lower UTI-type urinary tract infections. So very, very important to remember that uh, if we do have some potential uh, to have kind of a systemic infection or a larger infection maybe involving the kidneys uh, to likely avoid this drug and, and use other alternatives. Administration. Uh, administration with food does help absorption. Um, if there's a little bit of stomach upset or something too, you know, certainly that, that may help with that as well. Uh, there is a risk with pregnancy and particularly there's a contraindication from 38 to 42 weeks gestation. And this is due to the risk of hemolytic anemia. Okay. And with that, a test question I've seen up definitely come up on uh, pharmacology exams, final exams, board exams, uh, is this uh, thought of G6PD uh, deficiency. And G6PD, or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, this deficiency in G6PD is associated with a higher risk of hemolytic anemia. So basically this genetic variation um, can place patients at risk uh, for this problem from this this medication. So kind of a unique uh, genetic situation there that can uh, impact uh, potential adverse effects and uh, risks, of course. Adverse reactions... uh, you know, pretty much with antibiotic, you can, you know, claim GI upset. Uh, one really unique one with uh, nitrofurantoin that's fairly common is it does kind of discolor the urine. It, it may um, turn it into a brown or an orangish type color. Um, so that can be very unnerving to patients where they might think their infection is getting worse or what's going on now. Um, So definitely a a good education point there about that change in urine color. Uh, Less common side effects, but notable side effects, 
uh, neuropathy. That's kind of a unique side effect, maybe only thought of, you know, with chemotherapy agents or something like that. But uh, with nitrofurantone, that that is possible. One other unique one is pulmonary toxicity. So if you have any patients reporting uh, any nerve pain with a neuropathy or any challenges, symptoms, uh, struggles with breathing, uh, that's a very important thing for patients to uh, recognize there. This drug does accumulate with uh, kidney function reduction. So in patients who don't have adequate kidney function, uh, you may see an accumulation of this drug. So historically, uh, creatinine clearance of less than 60, that's a pretty high threshold. Uh, this drug has been contraindicated. Uh, there has been some you know, evidence, research, that type of thing that maybe it's okay to use in, in creatinine clearance of 30 to 60 mils per minute. Um, and, it, you know, again, this is going to be a, a clinical determination, a risk versus benefit uh, type assessment of, you know, susceptibilities, what other agents are available, you know, do they have allergies to other agents, and a, a good uh, sound clinical reasoning as to whether the risk of using nitrofurantone may be in kind of that moderate um, kidney impairment, you know, 30 to 60 mils per minute is worth it. Um, compared to, you know, not using it or, or if another agent is easily uh, and readily available. So um, kind of some, some controversy about that, um, but uh, definitely remember that if you've got somebody with kidney impairment, nitrofurantone is either probably not going to be used or we need to be really, really cautious with it. So definitely remember that. If somebody's got less than 30 mils per minute, as far as their creatinine clearance, uh, you're probably going to steer clear of this this drug altogether. Let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and we will finish up with drug interactions. Uh, if you're a pharmacist looking for test prep material, we've got Naplex, uh, BCPS, BCACP, BCGP, all sorts of different board certification study material. Uh, go check out, check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. Uh, also got audiobooks available there, uh, Amazon books available just for general clinicians, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, uh, physicians, a few really good books there that really uh, demonstrate clinical reasoning, uh, you know, drug side effects, drug interactions, and uh, really my perspective as a, a clinical pharmacist. So um, go check those uh, resources out. I don't think you'll be disappointed. And um, you can do that at meded101.com slash store. Finishing up on drug interactions, I will say nitrofurantone does not have a ton of drug interactions. So that is a, a plus uh, in the category of uh, antibiotics because we know, you know, drugs like quinolone antibiotics, uh, sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim, you know, those drugs definitely do have a fair number of interactions that can be uh, clinically significant for sure. Uh, so first one I, I want to talk about, I, I mentioned the food and the administration. Um, so food does actually improve absorption, so we can get um, higher concentrations with food, which is you know generally a good thing if we're trying to treat an infection and, and get adequate concentrations. Um, but just something to uh, remember, if you have a patient that didn't take it with food or did, uh, that may kind of sway those concentrations. Uh, there are a couple of rare vaccines. Uh, cholera and typhoid are a couple examples where this drug, nitrofurantone, may actually reduce effectiveness of the vaccine. So kind of a unique um, adverse reaction there, but um, just remember that uh, if you've got a patient where we're giving some vaccines and you know maybe they're on chronic nitrofurantone for UTI prophylaxis, uh, you've, you've got to remember that uh, it can potentially um, blunt the response uh, to some of those vaccines. Uh, and rarely there have been uh, reports of uh, hyperkalemia. Uh, honestly, I have never seen it in clinical practice, but I know it is uh, out there a little bit in the literature, and particularly hyperkalemia. Uh, with uh, the aldosterone antagonist, so aldactone, uh, eplerinone. Now, another antibiotic that comes to mind uh, when I think about hyperkalemia 
uh, is trimethoprim. That's another one um, that can definitely raise potassium levels in the setting of somebody, um, maybe on agents like those aldosterone antagonists that can uh, raise those potassium levels already. So just something to think about, something to, to keep in mind. I would say it's, uh, like I said, I've, I've never seen it personally um, in clinical practice, but uh, there is some literature out there to uh, support that that interaction can happen and potassium levels uh, can go up. So if you've got somebody that's borderline, you know, maybe around a five or something like that, uh, you know, there is risk with um, maybe adding a little nitrofranton on top of if they're already on spironolactone or something like that. I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Thanks for listening. Uh, go to reallifepharmacology.com, get your 31-page uh, top 200 study guide. Uh, great little resource, you know, for final exams and, and comprehensive exams uh, to kind of, that kind of pulls out um, major clinical pearls and things you should know uh, about those top 200 drugs. So that's absolutely free for following the, the blog and getting updates when there's new podcasts out. Uh, also got free Audible book. Uh, if you've never purchased an Audible book, you can go get that at meta101.com slash store. I've got the link. Your first one is free with Audible. Uh, Pharmacotherapy and the Thrill of the Case are two kind of case study, clinical pearls type books that I have created. Um, very, very cool resource for any you know pharmacist, uh, med student, PA student, nurse practitioner, uh, and uh, folks that are clinically oriented and, and have to think about um, using medications appropriately. So uh, go support the sponsor, MedEd 101, um, and uh, I will leave it at that for today. Thanks for listening.